Hi everyone, my name is Anita Dolce Vita and I'm the owner of Dapper Q. We really appreciate you spending your Saturday with us. Um, today we are um, in the fourth in a series of panels that we've curated and this panel is Queer Style as Visual Activism. This is a panel that we initially had presented at South by Southwest many years ago, but because queer uh, visibility, queer presentation, and the politics of queer style is not a one and done conversation. We have continued to have this um, panel with different voices and different perspectives multiple times. And I'm really happy today to have an amazing group of panelists today and also Gabby Royale, who will be hosting and moderating this panel. Um, before I introduce Gabby, I do want to say that I will uh, be kind of observing the chat box set section. We encourage you to be um, interactive and ask questions. I will be moderating the questions and then at the end of the panel we'll be fielding the questions to Gabby um, to field back to the, the panelists. So I'm going to do a quick screen share if I can remember how to do this with all the tech stuff that's happening. Um, let's see here. And so the reason why I wanted to share the screen is so that you can take a look at who the panelists are going to be today. Um, also see a little bit about their credentials. Gabby will be formally introducing them. But if all the panelists could kind of at this moment um, take it in the chat section, put where we can find you on social media. This way you all can copy and paste and, and look for these folks um, online on Instagram as I'm reading Gabby's bio. So. Gabrielle, Ro Gabrielle Royale, or Gabby, she, her, is the founder of Inclusion First Consulting, LLC, and serves as principal consultant for the firm. She is an inclusion, diversity, and equity strategist and talent consultant, helping Fortune 500 companies and mission-driven not-for-profit organization meet their talent development and hiring objectives. She has experience as an HR professional on Wall Street and works as a trusted advisor to her clients based in New York City and Los Angeles to bolster their early career talent and experienced hire pipelines. So welcome, Gabby. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, and I'm just going to kick it off to you um, so you can discuss with the panelists. Okay. Thank you so much, Anita. I appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to first thank Dapper Q for creating a space for us to discuss today's topic on visual activism um, and setting the stage for us to think deeply about the intersections of our unique identities and fashion, um, the critical importance of representation, and seeing dynamic versions of ourselves represented in global brands and its impact on our communities. Um, again, my name is Gabrielle Royal, um, I'm founder of Inclusion First uh, Consulting, and yes, as Anita mentioned, um, I've had the privilege of working with Dapper Q as an editor over the last seven years. Um, and so I'd just like to simply take a moment today to echo today's theme, um, fashion is a political tool. So I'd like to frame today's discussion with our esteemed panelists um, by encouraging everyone in the audience and all the on the call today um, as a call to action to think deeply about how we as a community leverage fashion, sometimes overt, sometimes covert, as a vehicle for expression, for performance, and the promotion of social change. So I hope each of you will leave today with a deeper understanding of how clothing brands can be used as allies, um, how we can show up, uh, and how they can show up as industry leaders for LGBTQIA um, folks within our community who have historically not been uh, represented throughout, you know, or have been left out of a number of these conversations. Um, so beyond clothing brands, what are the ways in which we can show up for ourselves and show up for each other through forms of queer fashion, expression, and activism? So that being said, I'd love to turn it over to, you know, our, our panelists, um, uh, Jeff Torres, uh, Leon Wu, Dr. M. Shelley Connor. Um, each attendee at this point has received the panelist bios, but I'd love to open it up to the discussion um, to, to the panel, just to briefly introduce yourselves, your, your pronouns and use, and then something unique you'd like to share with the audience that we can't find by LinkedIn stalking you or your social media. Um, so again, in no particular order, uh, would love to turn it off to turn it over to the panel. If you like Leon, you can go first. I, I see you popped up on my screen, so I'll turn it over to you. 
Okay, uh, thanks, Gabby. That was a, a really magnificent intro um, for this panel. I'm glad to be here today. My name is Leon Wu. I'm the founder and CEO for Start Suiting. And, um, you know, we've done this panel. This is the third time that we've done this panel. We're just excited to be here. Every time um, we do this panel, it's a completely different discussion. And, uh, yeah, just look forward to, to the chat. Um, Leon, what are your pronouns? Oh, uh, I for forgot that. He or they. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm M. Shelley Connor. I'm a writer and creative writing professor at the University of Central Arkansas. Um, this is my first time being on the panel, and so thank you so much for, um, you know, allowing me to be here. Um, most of my work kind of explores the intersections of um, a dapper queer aesthetic and self-sustainable living. Um, so. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I oh, am. Oh, pronouns. Oh, pronouns. Pronouns are, are um, she and her. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Jess. Um, so I don't forget pronouns are she and her. Um, I am a freelance artist and performer. Uh, I also have a small bow tie line called Atticus Atlas. Um, I began working with Dapper Q over the past year, um, and I'm very excited to be a part of the team uh, to continue spreading the message of inclusivity. Um, uh, something that specifically interests me is um, queerness in dandy culture. Um, so that's something that I've begun to explore a bit and uh, to share on social media and through Dapper Q um, as a platform. And uh, something that people don't know about me. Um, I don't know why this is the random thing I just thought of, but I know all of Romeo and Juliet by heart. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, no, bye. <laughs> that's awesome. We might put you to the test later, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> so appreciate that. Um, so look, we've, we've got a really exciting um, conversation today. I think it's relevant. I think it's timely. And we've got an esteemed panel of, um, you know, who I would consider subject matter experts in the space. And uh, what I'd like to do is just sort of kick it off, you know, first question here. Let's discuss how queer style um, as a form of activism um, you know, what kind of social impact do you see that making on our community? Um, I will just share a little tidbit. Um, there's a quote from, I, I'm going to butcher his name, I think it's Jean Cocteau, um, and it's, uh, style is a simple way of saying complicated things, and that's something that I think of often. Um, for me personally, when I get dressed in the morning, um, and for our community, um, as a whole, I feel like queer style is an opportunity to say a lot uh, without needing to say anything at all. Um, it's its own language and it allows you to stand in your power and step out into the world with confidence, reflecting and validating um, the essence of who you are and challenging gender norms and affirming our identity. Yeah, I um, I definitely agree with with that. Um, beautifully stated, too, Jess. Um, I feel, and and I guess my personal experience um, being a, a college professor, um, <laughs> every time I'm in the classroom and I'm wearing a bow tie or a necktie, um, you know, my activism is is in the classroom, and it's with you know twenty students looking at me, and so I need to communicate a lot to my students um, that isn't necessarily, you know, on the syllabus or in the curriculum, right? And so I, I find that my style of dress is a way to kind of layer um, all of these communications to my students, um, because one of the things that we're also doing when we teach in the classroom is we're modeling, um, and we're modeling social behavior for the students as well. And so if I can kind of, you know, normalize um, ungendered fashion, right, um, for um, 20 students at a time, and then it goes out and it just sort of um, multiplies, ideally. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to add to what Dr. Connor was saying about how what we wear is express expressing a political activism, like I'm wearing an NSYNC t-shirt right now. Um, you know, a lot of people might think that boy bands are a girl thing. 
Um, but they're one of my favorite bands. And, um, uh, you know, so that's how I kind of express uh, my visual activism. And, um, uh, you know, sharp suiting is, um, I really feel like our core business is design and styling. And um, one of our favorite quotes from the late Bornstein is that fashion is identity. And that kind of really goes hand in hand with ungendering fashion. Um, you know, not just, you know, how we show various queer um, or gender identities on the runway, but also in how we express who we are beyond, you know, um, what we wear and um, how we identify. Um, so Sharp uh, this year is really focused on taking that, um, you know, uh, fashion as identity is identity tagline and bringing it a step further um, uh, to launch a visual campaign where we focus on um, uh, people from the community and um, their various talents and exactly, you know, what they were put on this earth to do. Love that. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Absolutely. I was, you know, I was thinking as you all were talking about, um, you know, opening up pathways, you know, I'm thinking about when I was younger, um, being brought up in, um, from the, I'm from the South, you know, for example, in a specific region, having that experience and the expectation to perform my gender identity in a particular way vis-a-vis -vis the clothes that I'm selecting each day. So I'm curious to know in terms of responsibility for our community and for people coming after us, do you feel that we're able to take more risks now? Um, and do you feel that um, there is a sense of responsibility that you have um, as champions for our community or people um, who are in bodies that are politicized? So I'll just open it up to the group. I feel like we've come a long way in the past six, seven years. Um, this whole queer fashion movement um, has come at a great time within that movement. We've seen gender uh, marriage equality. We've seen um, more trans visibility, um, even in entertainment. And all of that kind of contributes to gender equality, which is you know, one of the main reasons why I started this company. And um, yeah, queer fashion has been around. And when I say queer fashion, we're not talking about <laughs> gay men in fashion necessarily, um, just that, secluded to that, because gay men in fashion have always been around. Uh, what we're talking about are <clears throat> women identify fashion, trans fashion, non-binary fashion, um, everybody else in the LGBTQ spectrum. And I really do feel like, you know, um, this movement has really come a long way. We've had pioneers, though, for years and decades. Um, and it just seems like the timing is right now. So I do think that it's a really good opportunity for us right now to kind of showcase ourselves, whether that's through fashion or what you do or, you know, what you bring as an entrepreneur into this world or an artist. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, and... <clears throat> It's something I think about a lot, even in terms of the way that I use um, social media and the way that I use that to express things and to kind of showcase um, my fashion. And I think about who could be on the other side of that screen um, because I'm very aware of the fact that I kind of live in a bubble, a wonderful, beautiful, you know, New York City bubble. Um, and I do think that it's come a long way, but I, I'm also aware of the fact that there are lots of places across the country and across the world where that may not feel like the case. Um, and so I, I hope that in expressing things freely and in more people doing that, um, that it begins to normalize different gender, um, gender identity expressions in our community um, and that it gives hope to those that maybe, you know, don't see reflections of themselves um, in their in their own communities, and makes them feel perhaps a little bit less alone. Yeah, yeah I I definitely feel that we do have a responsibility to um, others that um, you know are coming behind us. Right, um, we're not to a place where you know we can just say hey, I just want to be me, right? I, I think that's a luxury that when you're part of a marginalized community and especially um, intersecting um, marginalizations, um, 
what you do will always be politicized. What you do um, will always be more than just what you've put on, right? It always means something more. It always will be interpreted as something more. And so I feel one, the best thing that you can do is make a conscious decision that I know if I put on a bow tie, it's going to be um, sending a message, then I can at least be the one controlling that narrative that's, that's sent out. Um, and so it kind of reminds me of like the debate that keeps happening as far as with athletes and, and politics, right? Um, and it's like, oh, why don't they just play ball or whatever and keep their mouth shut and stuff like that, right? And it's like, you, I don't feel that you have the luxury to do that. And even though you have now kind of gotten this economic uh, privilege, um, you still have oppressions in other you know, areas with, with race and things like that. And so it's like, no, you now have a greater responsibility um, to the people who are coming behind you, to the people who are watching you, to make it easier. You know, like those who were before us made it a little bit easier for us, right? And so we have to continue to do that until we, you know, eradicate some of these isms um, and, and phobias. And that's not something that's going to happen in our lifetime. But, you know, we just have to take our, our time to um, dig the part of the trench, right? <laughs> to, to put in the, the paving of the path, right? It's not, it's not a golden highway. It's not a yellow brick road yet. It's far mm -hmm. from it. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to just quickly switch gears and talk about clothing brands. And I know, Leon, you've alluded to, to your brand as well, but um, this is a broader question for the group. Um, you know, do you feel clothing brands have a responsibility from a visual perspective to create space for uh, less represented bodies, diverse communities and identities? What does inclusion look like from this lens in an ideal world? And in your opinion, is there anyone out there that's doing it right? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think that at least from the, the companies and brands and things that I'm familiar with, the ones that are doing it right, um, are the smaller brands, you know, it's the sharp suitings, it's the Kieran Finches of the world. Um, I would love to see that, um, from a variety of kind of mainstream fashion, um, brands that maybe are accessible to everyone. Um, I, I feel like fashion as a whole still has a long way to go. Uh, as far as off the rack clothing, it's all kind of, it, it's, it's made to fit um, the ideal of a body that these designers have in mind. I don't think it's created with um, a variety of bodies and gender identities in mind. Or, or rather, I know it's not. Um, I know it's not when I go shopping. Um, oh, goodness. Um, and what's your call to action to them, Jess? If you had one. Uh, without using curse words on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, get it together. I mean, I, I just, I, I understand I understand the challenges, especially for a smaller brand. I was listening to um, one of the panels that Dapper Key put on recently, um, and somebody was talking about like the challenges of a smaller brand. I think it was Play Out. Um, a, a smaller brand creating enough inventory for um, all a variety of body types, right? Like the ch the challenges of that and the the challenges of that from a financial standpoint, from a demand standpoint, um, I understand that it's complicated, but I, I feel like even more so that these larger brands could get behind creating more diverse selection in their, in their clothing that they offer, um, and they just choose not to do it. Um, so I, I would love to see more of that. I would love to see more visibility for um, queer, for the queer community at large. Um, in the models in, in, in what's offered, you know, um, 
yeah, I, we have we have a long way to go in that regard, and it's it is heartening to to see the smaller brands that are are doing that. Um, but I I would love to see more of that in mainstream fashion. Great. Yeah, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Connor, would you like to respond, Leon? Also, your unique perspective as uh, you know, you know, as, as a leader, you know, in the industry from from this perspective. Um, curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, uh, sure. So, so you know, I mean, we um, have the luxury of doing custom clothing, no pun intended. But um, uh, you know, really. Uh, I feel like our clients are our constituents. Um, so the moment they walk in and we help them design a custom look for themselves, um, it's really about them. And you know, our, our um, tagline is we fit you. Um, and that's you know, anyone, including anyone who comes through our doors, LGBTQ, women or people of color, all shapes and sizes. Um, or even cis-normative people as well, or heteronormative people, um, we really are here to kind of express the identities of all of our clients to come in. And it's really, it, it's a long-term relationship when somebody walks through that door. And so in a sense, like, you know, even if they've had a suit done by Sharp, if they come to us and they want to voice their feelings, then it's our responsibility still to um, reflect who they are. Um, and, um, you know, we do that through custom clothing, but what we're doing now is um, for people that can't necessarily afford a custom suit, um, we'll be launching a uh, campaign to offer um, uh, virtual styling as well. So whether that's going on your first virtual date with whoever you've been quarantine texting or dating with, you know, um, and, and offering like a, top up only styling, you know, <laughs> um, or, you know, going through your whole closet with whatever you have and, and you know, do a little bit of um, late and spring cleaning and just overhauling your closet or looking at some of the pieces that you have had in your closet, but just didn't know how to use it. Um, uh, those are some of the things that we'll be launching soon so that, um, you know, people can further kind of express themselves and continue to uh, use fashion, you know, for fun things like dates and stuff like that. So not just weddings and uh, other special occasions. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I definitely think that um, those in the industry could be doing a lot more, especially since, um, you know, this isn't a secret from them that um, different bodies and and identities have been, you know, using um, their clothing and, and the styles. Um, representation certainly matters. So I would like to see, I mean, especially with things like neckwear, right? Um, <laughs> which already kind of fits the majority of bodies, right? <laughs> and so, I mean, I could, I could sell bow ties, you know, <laughs> um, with, with the image, right? Um, but, and, and why the representation matters is because you know, when we're looking at these advertisements, this is also kind of the first level of where you're learning about styling, right? And I promise you guys, I was a real, I, I was a hot mess when I <laughs> first started trying to put, you know, myself together. Um, one, of course, um, there, there were issues with the fit and all of that. And so I'm looking at, you know, this, this man in the magazine who seems to be my size, right? <laughs> he's very, he's very, he's very small. And so it's like, then why is it not fitting me like that, right? And so um, I, I think even, so especially starting with advertising and things like that. I also think, I, I find it problematic that you have so many um, queer identified people in the industry, right? And so this is one of those um, instances where you have, gatekeepers who all who are part of your community um, that are being used to sort of also keep you uh, marginalized right mm -hmm. um, so we don't necessarily have them opening the doors for us right it's hey you know I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and you know you can do the same thing and so um, I think that's problematic as well 
Yeah, there, there's certainly a lot of things to consider, especially from an industry perspective. Um, I, you know, when when I first moved to New York, I saw it as kind of the wild, wild west of, you know, I, I could become anyone that I wanted to be, you know, I was young, moving from Texas, and, you know, I stepped into department stores in Soho, and I was looking, you know, you know, just off the rack, trying to find things that would fit my body, and that also aligned with my identity authentically, an identity that was evolving over time, and um, I learned how to tie, you know, my ties on YouTube. I didn't have, you know, family to sit down and teach me how to do those things. So I had to get creative and innovative and um, went through all those, you know, just went through that evolution over time um, and finally found pieces that really spoke to me and really told the story that I wanted the rest of the world to hear. Um, and so, you know, in your view, what makes queer style unique versus any other aesthetic? I, I think it just seems to be, it lends itself to um, being customizable, you know, for, for individual taste, right? Um, it's, a, it's as eclectic as, you know, your own personality, right? Um, and so anything that you do in any way that you manipulate it is also kind of your personality is coming out in it. And so because um, almost by definition, it's subversive. Um, it lends itself to uh, having more flexibility, I think, um, than traditional styles. I agree. Yeah, I, I have to agree. Um, I like the, that you said it's subversive. Um, uh, so much of, you know, why I started uh, Sharp way back or just, you know, got into a uh, fashion or performing drag and then stock skinny on myself was really to show, you know, um, other types of identities out there. And oftentimes that was through subversion. And I feel like in fashion, um, you get to speak of the times and of the current events and, and be very political. Um, a lot of times what we've done is very subversive and, you know, um, you know, we're going to keep on bringing that um, again, you know, just uh, trying to mirror and display and showcase um, our community and our clients as much as we can. Um, and I, I feel like we have a good opportunity to do that right now uh, with the advent of social media just in the past decade. It's been pretty amazing. You know, when I was uh, first coming out, as uh, either gay or trans, I just, uh, I didn't have that outlet. And I feel like um, part of the reason why queer, queer style is, is able to happen right now is because we have that outlet to, to show and make visible different identities. And uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a beautiful thing. I, I always uh, advocate young people to start up an Instagram profile and yeah, gain followers and get excited about it. and you know, follow other people that are influencers to you as well. And, um, you know, just kind of keep that ball rolling. That's, that's actually a great segue to the next, uh, next question, uh, you know, Leon. You know, what, what platforms right now are being utilized by the queer style movement to create social change? And, and how is this impact different from other, um, different across, you know, various platforms? So if we're leveraging technology, you know, what are, what are ways in which folks within this queer style movement can do that to mobilize? I mean, sort of tagging onto what Leon was saying, I, I think I, I, overwhelming as I find it sometimes, social media um, has been paramount uh, in creating social change and impact in the queer style movement. Um, I also think that film and television um, has done a decent job, especially in the last handful of years, um, and more so in the mainstream than it ever has been um, with, you know, things like Queer Eye and Pose. And um, I know it was a handful of years ago, but um, Suited, the documentary that was made about um, uh, Bindle and Keep and bespoke suiting for a queer, queer community and um, even Killing Eve, honestly. Some yeah, killer style. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think I think all of these things have just served 
to further um, visibility for the queer community and, and normalize a lot of things that, that haven't been so in the past. Yeah, and, and each of you are coming from different areas of expertise. You're, you're performers, you're artists, you're business owners, you're educators. Um, so I'm curious to hear just sort of firsthand accounts of how you've personally leveraged visual activism to affect change within our communities. Yeah, I, I'd oh. say like I, I don't be afraid down. to brag. I, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I wish you would just like call on one of us. <laughs> and, like, should I say something or? <laughs> go for um, it. I, I go love for Dapper it. Q as a platform. Dapper Q has uh, done an amazing job of doing you know um, these great fashion shows um, every year, and um, uh, we're lucky that Sharp has had a chance to. Uh, participate in a few of them and um, you know we love partnering with accessory designers also um, inspired by the community um, or catered to the community um, and I just I feel like this pandemic is going to as, as as much of a struggle and as much of the challenge just that it presents that in, it somehow like catapults us uh, to kind of quantum leap into the future a little bit. And so, you know, we'll see many of these events that, you know, hopefully we'll get to go to again, face to face soon. Um, we're seeing them being, being done virtually. And um, uh, I, I think that presents a lot of opportunity for us. And it presents another opportunity for more people in the world to be able to attend like a visual platform. Like, you know, um, uh, if we're to have a visual fashion show to come up, um, and uh, as I was speaking to earlier, Sharp is um, uh, launching a, a, a visual campaign where we're going to be featuring um, music artists from the community, and we're very, very excited for that. Um, hopefully sometime this summer uh, we'll be launching that. And um, it is about identities, and again, that's playing on the whole thing with fashion is identity, not so much as it is people wearing like a Sharp blazer in you know a music video, but more it's going to be more about that person and, and, and showcasing that. Um, one of the things that um, when I when I really started thinking about style and messages um, and visual activism, uh, just becoming acutely aware of the associations that certain items that we all have with certain items, right? Um, a bow tie, people think, you know intelligence right <laughs> um that's what we uh, hope what's that so we hope yeah right right and so um we know that people have these associations and so i i use that to kind of curate um my messages to people um without having to say anything right if mm -hmm. i want to dress smartly or sharp or or whatever and so starting with something like that with a bow tie and then kind of, you know, filtering down to the slightest of details, color, right? Um, and so I, I think if you kind of take the time and think about these associations and stuff like that. And so on the one hand, you know, yes, I do want to ungender fashion. But on the other hand, I do also know that, you know, the language of the system, basically, right? And mm -hmm. so people identify, you know, bow ties with intelligence and, um, and things like that. And what I realized is it doesn't matter what body is wearing them, right? It just automatically cues for them. And they may be taken aback because, you know, I'm a woman, but they still react and respond to me in the same way respectfully as they would if I were a cis man wearing it, for the most part, right? <laughs> for, for, for light exchanges, like, you know, at the grocery store or something like that, right? Um, in, a, in a boardroom, it probably would still be a little different, but uh, just, just things like that. I mean, how many times have um, we really uh, socialized, especially, um, you know, growing up as women, what you wear, right? I, I think um, there's a hypersensitivity um, with those of us 
who, who grow up um, in girlhood that you have to watch what you wear because this is what it is going to mean to other people, right? And so um, I'm just kind of flipping the other side of that, again, controlling the narrative more. I, ideally, we all should be able to wear whatever the hell we want to wear. Mm -hmm. And whatever message people get is because of something that we've said directly to them, right? But mm -hmm. that's not the case. Um, and so right now, again, just trying to control the narrative. Um, but, but this is a, a temporary um, um, strategy because as um, uh, Audre Lorde said, you know, the, the master's tools will not disassemble the master's house, right? So. Great quote. No, it's great. And, you know, just, just a quick question, you know, just about how, have your styles changed or evolved? And how did you come to understand your personal style and brand? Um, Jess, uh, you know, Jess, I think you were up next. So. I mean, uh, it took me a very, 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 very long time to arrive here. <laughs> um, many awkward phases, many misguided purchases uh, at the mall. I wandered into a hot topic one too many times. Um, <laughs> Uh, and just playing with, you know, I, I always, I always gravitated towards a more masculine of center, um, gender expression. Um, and it just took me a while to figure out how to do that. Like, what does that look like? And, and when I go to actually execute it at a store, how do I find those things to fit my body? Um, I, yeah. And a, and a lot of it, I guess, just came from, I mean, there was so much frustration surrounding what was expected of me um, from society, from, you know, the very loving people that surrounded me that, you know, meant no harm, but just instilled certain things in me. And, um, and even just from jobs I had, I, I worked at a uh, hotspot um, for about five years here in New York and the uniform was, heels and a very low cut dress, a uh, very short low cut dress. Um, and I still don't, when I think back, know how I did that for so long, <laughs> but uh, it just, it created an even bigger desperation for me to find this thing that would make me feel at home in my skin. Um, and just, just playing was how I found it, you know, experimenting and playing. And I, I recommend that to anyone who's trying to figure things out and, you know, building a wardrobe to reflect what you want to express sometimes takes time. It's taken me many years and I'm still doing it. Um, but it's a worthwhile pursuit. Um, and for me, I guess social media has been uh, a bit, a bit of an art project. I never really liked using it in the past. Um, and I guess over the last year, my relationship to it changed when my relationship to my style changed. Um, and I had something that I felt, um, I wanted to express and share with the world. Um, and I started to create content that I thought that younger versions of myself would have wanted to see. Um, and I think that there's value in, in seeing someone who reflects back to you something about yourself that, that you haven't seen anywhere. I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, so that's something that I, I hope to continue doing um, on a larger scale, however I can. And being a part of the Dapper Q team has, has allowed me to do that as well. And I'm very, very grateful for that to continue to spread the message of inclusivity. Um, yeah. That's great. Leon yeah. or, or Dr. Connor, has your, how did you come to understand your style? Has it changed? Has it evolved? Thankfully, it, it has evolved. Um, I was always really um, uh, just concerned about balance between um, masculine and, and feminine presentations. And so for the longest time, I had very long hair for most of my life. Um, and so my last uh, long hairstyle, I had uh, locks. And so um, having long hair, it kind of protected me, I felt, as, as here is the aspect of, of feminine presentation, right? So that kind of allowed me to then get into neckwear um, and bow ties. But 
I, I got to a point where I really just wanted to cut my hair because I felt that, that that was the only reason that I was keeping it. And I think Lena Wave has said something similar, like she had this hesitation to cutting um, her locks because, you know, it would tip <laughs> the scale of balance into being too masculine presenting. And so um, I, I did eventually, you know, cut my hair as well. I, I did it in parts. So I was one who had the shaved back and the locks and, you know, would, would pull them up. And I was like, all right, you need to just kind of pull the trigger on this. And um, I really like, it bothers me. It bothers everyone to be misgendered. Um, and so I, I was worried about, you know, being misgendered as, as a, as a, not even a man, but as a boy, right? <laughs> and so um, it's always like, man, they're gonna they're gonna think I'm a I'm a boy. But what's funny is I've never been misgendered wearing a suit, a bow tie, a necktie with short hair. I'm misgendered when I'm wearing, you know, a form fitting um, sweatsuit, right? <laughs> and so you know, it's like a, again, just not worrying about what other people are thinking and being able to control the narrative myself. And I just had to kind of chuckle when that um, happened to me uh, recently that, you know, I'm not worried about being misgendered when I look like, you know, when I'm dressed like this. Um, but something that I would have thought, you know, would have been a little bit more feminine presenting, um, I was. So the second lesson is, you know, you know, just don't try to do that anymore. <laughs> just be yourself. <laughs> that story totally resonates with me. I definitely had long flowing locks when I moved to New York City. I was a Southern Belle um, and I did kind of a big chop um, and was actually still continues, you know, to be misgendered actually quite often. So I try to use that as a teachable moment as, as often as I can. But lots of interesting things that happen when you throw on a blazer or a tie or you, you switch things up. Um, uh, Leon, did you have any, any thoughts on that? How's your style changed? Has it? Yeah, uh, definitely has changed a lot and, um, style, not just by identity, but, um, just in general mood, how I feel and of the times, um, just going back to high school, you know, I was, um, uh, I played a lot of sports. I played water polo and basketball. So my favorite thing wearing to school would be jerseys because I felt proud, you know, with my team. Um, and you know, it gave me a chance to wear something masculine and it was expected, right? <laughs> uh, especially on a game day. And then the other thing that I did in high school was I was a, a, a big band geek. I was band president. So like when all the other girls were like, Oh God, I hate that we're going to have to put on our uniforms, you know, tonight I secretly like loved it, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, and, 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 you know, at school was really the only way that I could express who I was because I didn't really have much room, unfortunately, to do that at home. Um, I went through a weird phase where I tried really hard um, when I was at, uh, when I went to college in UCLA and I joined an Asian American sorority. Um, and that was me trying, really, that was the first time that probably I dressed in drag, <laughs> knowing how I identify now, you know? Um, and just like having to wear these dresses for formal occasions. And luckily the girls, all those girls, like they're like my best friends now. Um, uh, and they've been through so much growth with me in, in terms of my identity. They were actually the first ones that took me, um, like when we go shopping to Abercrombie and they're like, let's go to the men's side, you know, and try some stuff on, um, on me. And that was like a really nice, um, kind of like surprising support to have given, you know, the ordinary circumstance. But um, uh, I, I feel like even after that, my, my uh, uh, style has continued to change, not just by my identity. As I started to transition and feel more comfortable in my body uh, being a trans individual, um, I started to be more comfortable wearing tight clothes rather than like baggy clothes all the time to hide my body. Um, and, you know, definitely suits. I wear them a little bit more slimmer now. Um, uh, I wear lots of other clothes, like more formal or smart wear, um, tighter and form fitting. Um, but lately, the weird thing has been happening over 
in quarantine where I'm thinking of going back baggy nineties again, you know? <laughs> so I, I think it's just like, it's, it's, it, it's identity and it's of the times and it's just how you feel. And I feel like if somebody wants to dress one way in the morning and they want to dress another way the next morning, that's totally fine. And it doesn't matter how you identify. Yeah. If I could um, just add an, another little note, I, I actually wrote this essay called discovering my femininity in menswear. And I feel like that's kind of what happened. You know, um, I was always worried about balance. Um, but when I would try to dress feminine, I, I felt foolish. I don't know if I looked foolish, but I, I felt like I looked foolish, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I started wearing um, menswear, um, yeah. I actually started feeling more feminine, right? And, and like Leon said, I actually started wearing more um, fitted, uh, clothing as well. Um, and so now I think that's sort of where I get my, my balance um, from those energies in, in my clothing. So yeah, I found my femininity in a very surprising place. <laughs> that's been a, a similar thing for me as well. It's just sort of allowed me to fully step into myself and expressing myself with confidence and, um, and finding femininity in, in playing with the more masculine side of things. So yeah, that resonates mm. with me as well. Such great points. I mean, I feel like this conversation could be like a five or six hour. <laughs> I mean, we could just keep going. And I'm also super mindful of the clock um, as well. I have one more question. I'm going to open it up to uh, our audience who's been sending in questions via the chat function. Uh, my last question is really just around uh, thinking about a post-pandemic um, world. As people are stepping back into the workforce, there are more job seekers than ever right now, um, you know, given the crisis. Um, you know, I work a lot with people who are trying to be connected with large-scale organizations um, from an early career standpoint, talent development, talent recruiting, etc. Um, did you ever feel like you had to compromise your identity stepping into the workforce? Um, in any way, in terms of the way that you're uh, showing up for interviews. And I know everyone's coming from a different industry and different angle, but this is some of the anxiety that I feel like folks within our community experience, especially as we're, you know, looking toward a post-pandemic world and a lot of job seekers on the market right now. Um, how, how do you dress? How do you go into an interview? Um, should, should you feel like you have to compromise pieces of yourself, you know, to show up to an interview in a particular way, you know, given how difficult the market is right now. Um, so that was really the last question I have for the group. And I'm gonna switch over to the questions that are coming in. Um, I definitely worried about that. You know, I, I was on the academic job market for like three years um, before getting my current position. And one of the things I, I thought about was, um, do I go in and dress in a, you know, safer way um, get the position and then be myself, you know, become myself. But um, after, again, being on the market for, for that long, I started realizing that um, I've got to be me. And so what I started doing was kind of, and in, in education, you can do this because you, you have to submit um, a job packet and all of that. And because my work is now, um, is very important to me that all of these separate areas of my life um, connected, right? And so that's what I wanted my work to do. So I was able to kind of, you know, put in my job packet that this is my work, you know, that this is important to me. And so I'm pretty sure it probably turned a lot of um, uh, universities off, but I wouldn't know that because the only ones who contacted me, they were gonna know like three things they were going to know that i'm black they're going to know that i'm queer <laughs> um and they're going to know that this is also essential to what i'm going to be teaching in the classroom so i'm like if anyone you know sends me an email or rings my phone they know these things and that means that they want me they're looking for someone like me now with that said um we are in really, really dark times. And I feel that you have to do what you need to do for yourself and your family to survive, right? Um, so this isn't a decision that you can make um, lightly. And you may find that you might um, have to compromise your 
um, presentation. Um, but the one thing, style is changing and it is leaning towards this kind of unisex. So you can, um, you know, get away with, you know, maybe not full out bow tie, or maybe you could the uh, Janelle Monet bow tie it, right? <laughs> 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 something, something a little, a little floppier. Um, so, but that, that, that goes to what we were saying earlier about how queer style is so subversive and flexible. And so there's always a way that you can zhuzh it um, mm -hmm. however you need. There's a spectrum within the spectrum, I feel like. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think it is very personal choice um, and everyone has to make that for themselves. Um, you can, you know, maybe uh, get a, a custom suit and wear it without a tie. Um, but I think the main thing is that you have to feel comfortable with what you're wearing so that you can interview well. Um, the point of the interview is so they can get to know you. Um, and, you know, if you do take the approach of uh, just wearing what you think will get your foot in the door, um, then, you know, the other question is, do you feel like you're going to be happy working at this company? They don't know you who, for who you are uh, later down the line. And maybe the point is to get your foot in the door because you just, you know, you got to bring home the bacon right now. Um, it's such a personal, personal choice. Um, I'm sure anybody here on this panel would be happy to talk to people individually. Uh, it's, it's a good question, really good question. Yeah, I, I really just would be echoing um, the same thing these, these folks just said. Um, I think it is a personal choice. I myself am a bit biased because I spent so much time compromising um, what I felt was true to me. Um, and so I can't imagine doing that again in the capacity of uh, a workplace. Um, I, I do understand though that, you know, times are really tough and, and some compromises perhaps would need to be made um, to get your foot in the door and then be like, ha, gotcha. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, I think it's unique to everyone's, um, anyone's particular scenario. You just yeah. gotta do what feels right and what's right for you in that moment. What's hilarious is now if I happen to, you know, go on campus and I'm not wearing a tie or a bow tie, people seem very disappointed. <laughs> they start asking me, you know, am I okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you look so different. <laughs> I'm like, I literally just didn't put on a <laughs> Mm -hmm. But, you know, I will want to say, like, on a positive note, right now, with the economy down, it's um, interesting because um, we're at an opportune time right now. If you've been thinking of something that you wanted to do as an entrepreneur or some sort of creative project, right now is actually the perfect time to do it because everything's just going to go, well, it might go further down a little bit more, but it's going to go up eventually, right? And it's a perfect time for starting uh, a new endeavor. If you've had some sort of dream, um, we're quarantined right now. Um, there's a lot of time for self-reflection, self-awareness, and thus self-love. So it, it's a good time to kind of explore those opportunities and see if it's something that you want to try, you know, doing for the first time, if you've always dreamt about it. Yeah. Excellent advice. Uh, thank you so much for that. I think it's just such an important, you know, part of the discussion, um, given, you know, we're all about to step out into, you know, sort of a, if we have the privilege to, a, a kind of a new world, and we're all filled with a lot of uncertainty, right, especially around, especially around jobs, and sort of how do we, how do we show up authentically for ourselves and for our community, right? Um, just to shift gears very quickly, I'm mindful of time. We have a few questions that have come in. And the first question is, <clears throat> excuse me, during the time of shelter in place, how are you remaining visually active? Um, social media, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dapper Q, taking my, my daily walks, fully dressed <laughs> around my neighborhood with my mask on. Um, yeah, just, I mean, continuing to share and connect uh, virtually since that's all we, all we have at the moment. <laughs> so, and Jeff, there was just a, a 
Sorry about that, Dr. Okay. Connor. Um, there was just a style profile on you, Jess, right, in Dapper Q as well, okay. where you're giving us some, some, uh, you know, some quarantine tips on, uh, you know, how how to look great during. <laughs> I did a little quarantine or quarantine feature. Um, quarantine different feature. ways to, yeah. I mean, dressing up every day in in the quarantine has helped my mental health greatly, um, and it's sort of been fun to make an event of. Uh, seemingly mundane things like you know movie night I'll get dressed up for movie night and like like as if I'm going on a date <laughs> um, yeah I think it's I think it's important I mean you know if sweats feel right do it um, for me it's it's felt really good to, to have that sort of structure and to continue um, to exercise that that creative muscle that I use when I when I put together an outfit yeah, um, my my wife and I we we do date nights. We we get dressed up. Um, we cook fancy meals, so filet mignon, crab legs, seafood boils. There she's right there. <laughs> and um, and so um, my my other kind of outlet, I, I said I do you know dapper queer aesthetics and how it intersects with sustainable living. Um, so I garden. I do a lot of DIY projects. Um, I built this huge pallet planter, and so it's in the yard. So we grow our own food, um, DIY hydroponics, and then I, um, I make videos for it on uh, my YouTube channel, Dapper Vista DIY and more. Um, my wife and I, we also um, have a vlog, The Adventures of Pink Whiskey and Bourbon Girl, <laughs> um, <laughs> where we basically, you know, just talk about being, you know, two married uh, queer women, queer black women who've moved to the South from Chicago. Um, and so it's just kind of a humorous take on us and what's going on as we, of course, sip bourbon, which we both share love of. And so I think between, you know, those, those things, um, I'm pretty active. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes, like Jess said, it's it sweats um, and more um, a actually um, cargo pants and <laughs> you know for the for the DIY stuff. So uh, the um, I don't know what we would call it, what we would call that sort of type of dapper <laughs> um, functional dapper maybe DIY dapper. What'd you say, Jess? It's a utilitarian dapper. There we go. There we go. Um, so yeah, but yeah, again, but I definitely want to echo what Jess says. It's okay to not, right? To not get gussied up or, or anything like that, to just be in what's physically comfortable. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, right now it's, it's a lot of people are, uh, feeling a lot of fatigue and that's very understandable and so it's perfectly okay to take care of yourself and you know um, you know just uh, wear <laughs> the same sweatpants every day and um, you know I, I think we got to take care of ourselves during this time um, for sharp we're business as usual um, except uh, obviously um, depending on the state where the designer is we've got Marcia in Florida We've got Nikki uh, Eason in um, North Carolina, uh, Corey uh, Burton in Chicago, um, and then we've got Modern Affinity Bridal that are doing our suits in Houston, Texas, and then of course um, me, Tony, and, and Alex in LA. Um, even though a lot of our facilities that we do our design sessions are opening up in the next month, um, we're actually... Um, you know, actioning more on the side of being uh, more morally cautious and um, uh, starting to do virtual design sessions via Zoom. So we've done uh, quite a few of them already and, and a couple are going on today actually as we speak. And that's been going really well. Um, it still allows us to be intimate with our, our clients. Um, we do ask that they have a partner or a friend or whoever they've been quarantining with to help measure them as we instruct them how to do it. Um, so, you know, for us to stay visually active really is to still try to provide our services to our clients as much as we can, especially if they have a wedding coming up. And um, that way it kind of buys us time to have these virtual uh, sessions and then we'll actually meet with them when the fitting comes a couple of weeks prior to a wedding 
or a special occasion. And um, yeah, for, for us, it's just really about um, being there still as much as we can, even during tough times. Sounds great. Uh, you know, just a couple more questions coming in here. <clears throat> Um, for the group, what does the economic landscape look like for queer brands in the post-COVID-19 recovery process, which I think, Leon, you already touched on. Don't know if you have any other comments there, um, Jess or Shelley, if you'd like. Um, economic landscape look like for queer brands post-COVID. I mean, I'd like to remain hopefully optimistic. <laughs> um, Hmm. A lot of uncertainty, no, I think, yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard yeah. to say. There definitely um, is a lot of uncertainty, but I, I, I do feel like um, our designers, um, you know, Sharp, we're friends with a lot of different queer designers, um, and they're really smart people, they're really intelligent and they're very relentless in serving our community. And I think that, uh, you know, a lot of queer brands are gonna be here to stay and maybe there'll be some more. Um, and if you wanna start a queer brand, I say go for it. This is perfect time to do it. I mean, I'll still be cranking out my bow ties from my bedroom, Atticus <laughs> Atlas shop, if anyone wants to check it out. <laughs> Great. The next, uh, the next question for the panel is, <clears throat> I was asked to speak about queer fashion in the workplace for a financial group. When I tried to include a slide on the October 8th SCOTUS case, which heard arguments over whether employers can fire employees for being LGBTQ, including not adhering to gendered dress codes, I was asked to remove the slide because the company is politically neutral. Can you speak to how queer fashion and queer presentation can never be politically neutral? Great question. Oof. This one we could spend quite a bit of time on, actually. <laughs> Who wants to take it? <laughs> I feel I should wait till the blood stops bubbling inside. <laughs> and again, this goes back to kind of the conversation around having to compromise sort of, you know, our values for corporations and, you know, having to, you know, it, it, it's, it's really complicated. Sometimes I think um, as it relates to our identity, our community, um, and oftentimes being the champion or the spokesperson for those communities, if we're, mm -hmm. if we're placed, if we're, if we have a position of privilege and, and, and a seat at the table, does that mean then you have to sort of compromise your values when it comes to things like this? So again, the question, I was asked to remove the slide because the company is politically neutral. Can you speak to how queer fashion and queer presentation can never be politically neutral? Yeah, I, I mean, I think something that's so tied to your identity, and especially if that identity um, has oppressed you in some way, right? Um, you know, fashion is one thing, but even before I put any clothes on my body, I have my skin, right? And, you know, my skin is not politically neutral, right? And so anything that I clothe the skin in is also not going to be politically neutral. And I think that's also a really good um, visual representation of intersectionality, right? So it's um, these masculine clothes on, you know, this black um, female body, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it just, it isn't. It's... I think I said it before, it's, in, it's inherently subversive. Um, and so, yeah, that's... <laughs> um. It's tough, it's, it's a really, it's a challenging position to be in, I'm sure. Um, so I empathize with who, um, with the attendee who submitted the, the question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it is a, a question that is an oxymoron in itself. Um, uh, 
gosh, I, I, I would, I would just say though, I, I feel like um, uh, whenever there is a change, even if there is a shift in the economy that's south, um, that is still a change or a delta or a gap. Um, and anytime there's a gap, there's, there's a chance to be opportunistic about that. And so I go back to advocating for more creative people and entrepreneurs to take their dreams to the next level during this time. Um, because it's so important. Um, during tough times or sometimes in the past when we've had the best art or the best political movements. So I think everyone truly needs to find in their heart what that is, what is authentically you and what you're authentically brought into this world to bring um, to humanity and, and really, you know, do that self-reflection and, and do it right now. Yeah, and also, um, if you know that it just can't be politically neutral, then again, what I said earlier, control the narrative. You know, take control of the message, knowing that it's going to be political. What are you going to say um, through your queer fashion? Uh, take the slide out, but uh, say it another way, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's a tough the next question. question to be in, though. Yeah. No, it's, <clears throat> it's really tough. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah. The next, we have two questions left for the panel. Um, so the next one is, what's the best way to get into modeling for fashion brands that are gender inclusive? Oh, I mean, I guess just direct contact. I don't know, it can't hurt to just reach out, honestly. I think a lot of, I think a lot of companies that are, um, are showcasing models that, um, our varying body types and gender identities um, are are more open to people directly contacting them. So I would imagine just reaching out is a good first place to start. Yeah, social media being more more visible um, says the person who is not very social media savvy. But any opportunities that I've had to um, model for for brands or contact has come because of what I've been doing in the community and photographed and, you know, I put things on Instagram and hashtag it. And so um, people follow that as well. Um, starting again with the, the, the smaller brands that are queer inclusive, um, who are looking for models and, you know, I just wanted to help out. So it wasn't even about pay or anything like that. I just thought it'd be nice to have a professional photo of myself that I could then use for things. So um, a lot of times, even if you're willing to, you know, do a trade off for that um, with a smaller brand. Yeah. Yeah. Com completely agree with Jess and, and Shelly. Just, um, you know, put yourself out there on social media, definitely reach out. Um, you never know for the next fashion show, a queer brand could be looking for exactly your look. Um, but more so, um, I feel like it's, it's more about who you are and, and what you do. Um, like, you know, um, with Jess and Shelly, their brands too, and what they represent, what they talk about, the things that we discuss on these panels. Why is it important to you to be a queer fashion model? Uh, that, I think, is the, the most important thing. Awesome. Uh, the next question is, what advice would you give your younger self or younger people trying to explore their gender identity and expression and personal style? And I think we kind of touched on some of those themes earlier in the discussion. Yeah, Play dress up. Don't be afraid to play dress up in your own home and comfortable, safe space. Um, one of the things that I, I still like playing dress up, right? Um, one of my stress releases is karaoke at the house and I've got an amazing setup, but I'm not just picking my song. I'm also picking out the outfit, the personality that I want to, you know, come through uh, when singing the song. So have fun with it. And then you'll find that you can find yourself just playing around. What's your favorite karaoke song, Shelly? Oh, I'm curious. It depends on the mood. Um, 
whatever, whenever I find a song that's new or that I've been looking for for a while. So it's been lately, um, We Don't Have to Take Our Clothes Off by Jermaine Stewart, an 80s song. And so I was like, man, I found this on karaoke. So um, yeah, I even did a little karaoke uh, commercial, like the Time Life uh, music uh, collections. So I did a commercial like that. It's, it is on YouTube. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll send it through. <laughs> we'll be watching that later. <laughs> I agree though, just playing. Just uh, if, you, if you're not ready to, to show it to the world, play, play within your four walls. Um, and I don't know, having, having I think a support system that it, you feel comfortable with. Um, to share these things with as you're exploring your identity, I think is huge. Um, just finding your people. Yeah, that's definitely important. Having your support group. I've been playing dress up since I was five in my dad's closet. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, I did that in secret when nobody was around. Um, uh, yeah, doing that, definitely having your support group. And just in, in general, just being very authentic with yourself and also being patient with yourself too. Um, like, you know, identities can definitely mature, but they're also changing over time. And, you know, maybe, you know, my identity or our identities will continue to change in our style. So um, just know uh, if you're authentic with yourself and you're patient, then there's no rush, you know? <laughs> You can be you. You can do you anytime, any time of the day, any year. It's always okay to, to change your mind and for your style to evolve, right? Absolutely. Um, so the very last question I have for the panel is, uh, I would love to hear more about the connection between dapper queer style and sustainable living. What is that theory about? Maybe, can you rephrase the question or? Yeah. I think because we were discussing sustainable living, I think this might be, um, this might be in response to uh, an element of the conversation earlier, Shelley, that you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear more about the connection between dapper queer style and sustainable living. Yeah, so part of sustainability um, and sustainable living is creating safe spaces and, um, people who need, who really need safe spaces are us, right? And so um, how can we create safe spaces for ourselves, our community and culture, right? And so um, it's kind of moving from the outside in and inside out, outside what you're putting on your body, inside what you're putting in your body, right? So healthy living, growing your own food. So all of this, you know, is connected in a cycle. Um, it doesn't matter if you know how to tie a bow tie if you aren't able to, you know, feed yourself nutritional meals, right? And so it's about being healthy externally and internally, and then also creating safe spaces um, for your community. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so look, we're, we're about 13 minutes after the hour here, um, but I think it was a really great discussion, one that we should definitely continue. Uh, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, the last thing I'll say is fashion as activism can proclaim an important political message to us all, a message of protest, a message of belonging, and a message of social change. So thank you all for joining today's discussion, and thank you for supporting Dapper Q. Thank you. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I just wanted to send a special thank you to everybody who participated today, being involved with these continued conversations and con community building, particularly at a time where we cannot be um, engaged in person. Um, we received a lot of positive feedback. And I think that this is an opportunity to kind of continue to have these discussions virtually and digitally reaching areas um, that we have not reached before. You know, a lot of our in-person um, events are often 
uh, kind of localized around the coast. Um, and so while people in New York and LA um, are really feeling this kind of sting of not having this community, um, a lot of people write to Dapper Q all the time who live in small towns who don't have access to um, a community center or regular queer bar or um, access to panels or even a, a store like Sharp Suiting. So in a lot of ways, um, kind of the silver lining to all of this and having us all together on Zoom is that we're able to make these connections broader with um, communities across the country and across the globe. So um, I thank you all for inviting us into your homes today and for sharing this space. And for anybody watching, this will be up on YouTube later on. Um, and I will also include in the description where you can find the panelists on um, Instagram. So if you wanna continue the conversation with them personally, we welcome that as well. So thank you all. And um, I'm also gonna share a screen because I'm actually gonna be a panelist on another topic because we could talk about queer visibility um, all night. Um, and so the next panel that is coming up is going to be on femme identity. Um, so for any of you who are interested in that, this is going to be at Curve Magazine. I'm going to copy and paste this link here so that um, you can, and I'll put this in the chat, if I could figure out Zoom ever. Um, so I'll stop there. Let me stop the sharing there. And then I'll put the, the um, the link there. Um, so we're going to continue to have this conversation. We hope that you can join us there as well. But again, huge thanks to all of the creators, the designers, the academics, all the people who are doing great work. Um, thank you for being part of the Dapper Q family, and we will see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. Bye.